Being able to turn off my inner monologue has come with peace, with joy, with mental resilience, with improving the quality of my life to such a degree that arguably this is the greatest thing I've ever done. And because it's the greatest thing I've ever done, I want you to do it too. Because I want you to have the same quality of life. To go around talking to yourself and creating suffering for yourself for the rest of your life is not something I want for you. And that's why I want you to apply the things I'm going to say in this video, because I'm going to tell you how I did it. Honestly speaking, you're very lucky. Watching this video is probably the most productive thing you could do right now, and if you think I speak slowly, speed up the video. Now to turn off the inner monologue, you need to understand why it's there in the first place. And the only person that has an answer for this question is Peter Alston. And the genius of being, he has a certain section where he talks about why people talk to themselves. and in reality, they're not talking to themselves. You're actually talking to what you perceive as other, as someone else, okay? If you observe your thoughts very closely, you'll notice that in whatever way it is that you're thinking, you're actually directing what you're doing in your mind toward someone else. It doesn't have to be someone specific, it just has to be the concept of there being someone that is able to listen to you. The mere fact of there being someone else. That is what you're directing it to. The import lies in the possibility of being a sentient entity capable of communicating with other sentient entities, because that possibility is necessary for language, and therefore an internal dialogue to occur. So the activity of internal dialogue holds the presence of the possibility that creates self and other as sentient beings. Keeping this activity rather constant manifests and grounds this existential presence in your experience. It maintains you as a sentient self because it is constantly generating other as present in your experience. Now this might seem very confusing at first, but let me explain it in a much better manner. You see, for you to think of yourself as a human being that exists, there has to be other people. For you to be something, you have to be distinct from other people. Imagine we draw a circle. This circle is everything that is you. For this circle to exist, there has to be whatever is outside of the circle, whatever is not you. So a tree isn't you but your hand is you, your hand is within the circle, right? So for this circle to exist, you have to maintain not only what's inside of the circle, so what you call yourself, you have to maintain others. You have to maintain everything that is not you, because both of them lead to you existing. So when you're talking to yourself, you're drawing the circle, you're creating other because you're maintaining the fact that you're someone who is able to communicate with others. And this is very important because your survival is reliant on others too. And so the reason you have an inner monologue is to maintain your idea of yourself while maintaining the idea that you're a human being that is able to interact with others. That is why you're constantly interacting with others. Again, it relates to survival. If there is proof, the proof will only be within your own experience. And what Peter Olson says is that if you create an experience where there are no sentient beings that you can communicate with, that the entire possibility of communicating doesn't exist anymore within your universe, within your perception, then your inner monologue will fall apart. It won't be there anymore. Because the sole function of your inner monologue is to maintain the fact that you're someone who can communicate with others. Again, you're someone, that's the emphasis really, that you are someone who can communicate with the other they are the same thing really. Well, this is the existential reason as to why you talk to yourself. The problem is that if you want to take this approach to permanently remove your inner monologue, what would happen is that you would have to remove self. You would have to remove your sense of self. And ultimately, any human being would be much happier by doing this because you'd essentially remove suffering because desire is suffering. And this can be seen very clearly if you just investigate it a little bit. However, this is a topic for another video. This is a more complicated way of going about things. What I've just described is the equivalent of taking the entire machine of inner monologue and then completely destroying it by seeing how it works. What I've done is not this. I haven't achieved this yet, but of course this would be the most desirable outcome. What I've done is I've looked at the machine and I've looked at how to shut it down. I've practiced shutting it down and now I can shut it down. And this is what I'm going to teach you in this video. But before that, 
we need to look at thoughts, because the inner monologue consists of thoughts. And thoughts, in this case of the inner monologue, are dependent on language. You see, you think that you're simply talking to yourself in your preferred language, but that is not what's happening. And to understand what's happening, you need to realize that first of all, whenever the inner monologue is occurring, you have tunnel vision. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, to understand what's actually happening, you need to look at how deaf people think, or more specifically, what language deaf people speak in. And to illustrate this perfectly, think about going to the gym. You'd say, I'm going to go to the gym at this time. And you would, you know, use words, you would talk to yourself to describe the thought. Now do it without words. Just have a mental image of you going to the gym and a feeling sense of, okay, I want to do this. Now you've done the exact same thing, but without words. And that's exactly how deaf people think. They don't use language. They simply use mental imagery, exactly like you do. And here's the problem. Language is superimposed upon the mental images. The inner monologue is not just you saying things to yourself. That's not just the inner monologue. It's also the mental images and everything else that you're thinking about, but not putting into words. You need to be aware of this entire domain of thought to be able to turn it off. Because once you're aware of it, it will cease to exist. If you skip to this part of the video because of the timestamp, go back and watch the rest. And that's because the earlier part of the video is just as insightful as this part of the video. Again, I'm not trying to waste your time, this is simply the truth. Now the first step I took to shut off my inner monologue was I created the possibility. And for that to be the case, I had to stumble upon a person who could actually do this, who could actually speak in a way that made me realize that this is the natural state of a human being. And this person was Eckhart Tolle. I read his book, The Power of Now, and I watched his YouTube videos. Now, who is Eckhart Tolle and why should you listen to him? This guy was very, very depressed during his 20s. And when he was 29, you know, he was suicidal. He wanted to kill himself. And one day, or one night, he was sleeping, or he was going to sleep, and he said, I can't live with myself anymore. And then suddenly, I looked at the thought, I kind of stood back from that thought and looked at it and said, that's a strange thought. I cannot live with myself. Am I one or am I two? This, this thought seems to show that there's two, two people here, I and the self that I cannot live with. He sort of disassociated from his thoughts after this insight. And then he woke up. And when he woke up, everything he looked at was super beautiful and his experience was extremely peaceful. All I know is that the next morning I woke up and I opened my eyes and I looked around the room and everything seemed as if I was seeing it for the first time, fresh, new, alive. The light coming through the windows, familiar objects on the table, they looked fresh, new and alive. So I got up and went out for a walk and I looked around and everything seemed so peaceful. Even the traffic in the city seemed so peaceful and I knew something strange had happened. There was suddenly, everything was filled with aliveness and peace. And mind you, this happened when he was 29. He's an old man now and he says that his experience has stayed the same way. Not in the same intensity, but this peace never really left him. The way he started to operate never really left him. And he went deeper and deeper into it ever since then. Then he started investigating, okay, well, why is my experience like this? Because at 29, he didn't really understand what had happened to him. So he started digging into his experience, seeing why is it that I'm very peaceful right now? What is it that I'm doing that other people aren't doing? And he realized that a very big part of it was that he wasn't talking to himself. He wasn't creating any mental suffering because if you look at suffering itself, most of it comes from your mental state and your mental state is usually associated with you talking to yourself. There is no mental state if you're not thinking really. And so being exposed to him and his teachings really helped me a lot. And the main gist of it is two things. He has a practice and then he has a very big insight. And that's why the book, the first book that is, is called The Power of Now. The first step was, of course, to create the possibility. We've got that now. The second step is to realize that the present moment is where your life exists. If you're in the present moment and you focus on wherever you are, 
you'll have less energy or attention directed toward creating thoughts. The third thing is the only practice that Eckhart Tolle has ever recommended, and that is whatever you're doing, wherever you are, and for the entirety of the time that you're awake, try to be as aware of your breath as possible. And this has incredible transformative power, trust me. And this serves two things really when it comes to the inner monologue. First, you're building the concentration to be able to be aware of the inner monologue so that you won't start just thinking because you're so aware of the thought space that you can choose to think whenever you want. The second part of it is that if you're extra aware of your breath, you're going to be extra aware of your thoughts and you're also going to divert attention toward the breath and when you do this you automatically think less so a very easy way of shutting off the inner monologue is just to think or be aware i should say of your breath because you can't really do both at the same time you can if you're pretty good at awareness but you might not be there yet but this is not the only thing i did so you can describe this as passive meditation where you're trying to be aware of the breath at all times. That's a passive practice. I also did active meditation, which is when you sit down and you truly, truly try to concentrate on some sense store. It could be sound, it could be sight even, it could be the body, it could be the breath, it could be whatever it is. When you do this, it's like actively working out your legs versus walking. So if you walk, you're going to get stronger legs, you're going to get better at walking, but it won't be as effective as if you were to do a bunch of jump squats every day and then you go walk. When you walk after having trained, you'll feel much lighter because your legs have been strengthened much more because the work that you did required a lot more effort. You put a lot more energy into it and so now something more passive is going to be even easier. Now here's where I disagree with Eckhart Tolle. I recommend that you do his practice of always trying to be aware of your breath at all times together with meditation because the thing is when you start out with this like I did you're not going to be good you're going to lose track of your breath many times for many hours of the day while if you do active meditation and you really put in the effort you really train the concentration muscle when you do this this becomes a completely different story now when it comes to sitting down meditation or you know you put a timer and you're trying to actually do it the active meditation I don't want you to just put a timer and then do it in a half fast manner I want you to be able to measure it in a good manner and so this is what I'm going to recommend put a timer on one minute just one minute and if you think that's too much do 30 seconds or 20 seconds and for this minute, I want you to be completely aware of something. It could be your breath, it could be sound, it could be your body, but the breath is usually a good way to start. If you lose track of the breath during this time period, you reset the timer. If you don't, you increase it. Okay? You increase it, and then if you couldn't do two minutes, then you do two minutes again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And then, okay, you did two minutes, you do three minutes four minutes, five minutes. And if you look closely, what's happening is that you're not thinking for this minute. You're not thinking for two minutes, for three minutes, for four minutes, for five minutes. And this is much better because one, you can measure it. In relation to other meditation methods where you just do an hour, where you time it in that way, you're actually measuring your progress in a much more measurable fashion. While the guy who's just doing one hour every day, he's just trying to get through the hour. He can't really measure his progress. While if you do it in minutes, you can really measure your progress. You can really say, okay, I didn't think for seven minutes. And so slowly but surely, you'll see that in your daily life, you feel much better, you're more peaceful, and you can turn off your inner monologue because you've trained your concentration to such a degree that you can see things clearly. You can see your mind clearly, your body clearly. And so by doing that, you're not doing things unconsciously. And when you don't do things unconsciously, you get freedom. And with freedom, you also get peace. Lastly, I want to talk about how life changes. Because as an example, my social performance has gone up drastically. It has become much, much better. I feel much more peaceful. Whenever there are negative thoughts or a negative emotion, I can identify it immediately and I can see through it. Or I can concentrate on it and I can create no more of it really. 
So either it just completely goes away like the thought, or if the emotion still persists, it can be there. I have no problems with it. So what I'm saying is, I'm immune, or you become immune to negativity. You don't create negativity. You don't create um, unnecessary stuff within your internal environment. Another thing is mental clarity. By not thinking, you get immense mental clarity. Everything is, you know, very clear. Everything is organized. You also become very emotionally resilient because if we think back to the stoic rule where if I can do something about something, then I shall perform the action. And if I can't do something about it, then I shall not create suffering around it and I shall not pour energy into it. To do the latter part of the stoic rule, you have to be able to turn off your thoughts. You have to be able to see through your emotions because otherwise you'll be pouring energy into something that you can't influence. And you won't pour energy into things you can't influence if you're able to understand your internal environment. You also become so much better socially, at least I have. And that's because when you do all of these things, you lessen your sense of self. And lessening your sense of self means that you have less associations and thoughts about yourself in relation to other people too. So you have less thoughts about others. When you interact with someone, there's less of your baggage being there influencing the interaction. So whenever I talk to someone now, I don't have any thoughts about them and I don't have any thoughts about myself or my own behavior. I am there and I'm listening to them and I'm treating them as if I've known them for a long time. And instantly what happens is they treat me in the same way. And so whenever I have an interaction with someone now, I become friends with them very, very easily. And I have no fear of interacting with other people which I used to have before. So social anxiety goes away completely. Social anxiety is mostly a byproduct of talking to yourself excessively and having a very strong sense of self. Be aware of your breath right now. Now, if you've ever wanted to know what the meaning of life is, I've answered the question in a perfect manner in this video. So go and watch it if you want. And if you don't want to watch that video, then I have a bunch of other videos about nutrition, about health in general, about existential matters like what the meaning of life is. And on top of that, I have the 10 dietary rules, which is a free PDF that you can get on my website. It's the 10 dietary rules that make nutrition easy, jam-packed with very helpful information. Stop thinking. I know you can do it.